Next on Heartland Highways, we're off to a performance by the Actors Rural Theater Company based out of Tuscola, Illinois. We'll go behind the scenes to learn more about what it takes to put a performance on. Then we're off to Hillsboro, Indiana to meet the husband and wife team behind the Myers Dinner Theater. Finally, we'll learn more about the EIU Building Memories exhibit. The exhibit features research, photos, and artifacts about what creates a collective memory for people who have come and gone at Eastern. That's all coming up next on Heartland Highway, so stay right here. They've been around since 1978, entertaining audiences from East Central Illinois. Hello and thanks for joining us for Heartland Highways. We're talking about the Actors Rural Theater Company, or ARTCO for short. They're a group of theater-loving individuals based in Tuscola, Illinois. Now this summer we met the group as they were preparing for their summer performance of Into the Woods. We got to see firsthand how these volunteers come together and put on a great show. I just know that the people that have done community theater, even maybe just one show, know know what what community theater is and know that the it's like a family, and so that's what brings people back, is because everybody loves everybody and we get we get along for the most part. It gets a little edgy toward the end, but but we get along. For more than 30 years, the Actors Rural Theater Company, or ARTCO, has been performing for audiences in East Central Illinois. Founded in 1978 in Villa Grove, the group moved to Tuscola in 1988, where they've been ever since. Over the years, they've performed many familiar and favorite musicals and plays, all with volunteers who just love theater. Some of us have theater background from college, uh -huh. and we have other people who just love doing it. They, that's not necessarily what they grew up doing or they got their education in, but we have an insurance uh, agent, we have a young man who is, uh, works at the law library at U of I, um, I'm a retail management person. Um, we have people who are in construction, we have people, yeah, I mean all walks of life that just have a passion to do this. We grew up in the theater, we helped out with the costumes, we helped out with the set, you know, we stayed not long nights there and slept and we got to play in the, with the costumes and the props and just, I don't know, we were able to be kids but we were, you know, able to e express our creativity a little bit. It was. It was a lot of fun. The reason I believe in it is when I was a little kid, I was really shy. I mean, really shy. My mom had to make me talk to people, okay? And I don't think that that's the impression I give anymore. No. <laughs> and it, it, when I just remember it as being the most, it's like a team building thing. It's like a family. It is, it is, it brings people out of their shell. Okay, 1996, we were at Village Grove Community Theater, uh -huh. and we were doing uh, The Secret Garden. And it was a show that I just loved the music, so I went up and talked to the director, and I said, hey, I want to build your set. And I don't think he's ever had anybody say that to him before. He said, oh yeah. So um, we got involved in that, and he also, he liked the voice, and he said, I want you to audition too. And I said, now wait a minute, enough is enough. And they talked me into auditioning, and I ended up with a sweet, sweet part. Played all eight shows and had an absolute ball, and the theater bug bit me, and it really bit good. <laughs> For their summer 2012 performance, Arco took on a challenging musical called Into the Woods by Stephen Sondheim. But because of its content and the way Sondheim writes and stuff, it's, it's kind of a, uh, pretty close to three hours. But you never really feel like it takes that long because you're in this fantasy storybook land, which everybody can relate to, you know. But they learn a lot about themselves and a lot about choices and 
being a human being and the frailties of the human condition. And it's so just amazing. I was caught nowhere, and I thought, well, he I am playing Cinderella, and we are, um, my character is, you know, Cinderella. She's, she's going to the ball, and she is in love with the prince, and she doesn't know if she wants the prince, and in the end, the prince and her don't end up together. They, they get married, and in the second act, everything's happy at the beginning, and then it all kind of falls apart. Ten weeks of rehearsals went into getting ready for this performance. About two weeks before opening night, the company started moving in sets, lights, costumes, and actors into the Tuscola Community Building. At this stage, we are putting the set up, and we are, as actors, we are pr practicing from start to finish, doing our run-throughs, and tweaking things, getting sound cues, and light cues will be getting lights in the next couple of days, and sounds and then, uh, sound cues in the next couple of days, and, and then we do dress rehearsals until Wednesday, and then we open on Thursday. The process is awesome to see it all from the start to finish, to see what it was at the beginning and how it made itself in the end. This particular show, because of the difficulty of music, the fact that we were renting our our accompaniment orchestration. So we had to rent um, the rehearsal score and then we had to rent what will be the performance score. You have to be on top of your game to be able to sing with a canned orchestra. Um, and the music's quite difficult. Most people knew that coming on board though and that's why they auditioned because they love this show. A lot of us drive and a lot of us do have full-time jobs and have to, you know, beg and plead and you know, coax our bosses into letting us come to practice because it's our passion, you know, and you know, we make it work. <laughs> For this show, I'm a costumer. Right, so I'm, help, I'm working with Laura to put together the costumes for the show, try them on people, make adjustments to things, make things from scratch, you know, that type of thing, design them, whatever it may be. Um, um, in other types of shows, I've been in them, I've directed them, I've helped with props, I've been the producer, you know, pretty much every hat that could be worn, yeah. It's definitely a team sport because you, everybody has to work together for it to work. But that, my passion for it's been, my husband hasn't seen a lot of me over the past few years because I'm usually busy doing theater. And it's that passion for theater and working together that has kept Artco going strong all of these years. If it's not fun, I don't do it. It's just that simple. So, um, you know, I'm having a ball. I'm having a good time. The, the, people, are, the people are just absolutely fun to work with. Uh, and that goes from, from our 7th and 8th graders all the way up to well, the other old guy over there. <laughs> so. Closing night is bittersweet. You're really usually ready for it to be over and go back to your normal life. But at the same time, you know, the show's over. You, you get to say goodbye to your friends for another year, or maybe, or longer. And um, the show's over and, you know, and... You don't want it to end, but at the same time, you're, you're almost ready, you know? Artco generally does two large productions per year, in addition to some smaller traveling programs, like hosting murder mystery dinners. Through the support of the community of Tuscola, theater patrons from the region, and volunteers, Artco will continue their tradition of providing quality community theater for years to come. Continuing with theaters, we're headed to Hillsboro, Indiana for dinner and a show at Myers Dinner Theater. This unique venue is run mainly by Richard and Donna Myers, whose motto is come as a guest and leave as family. And that's exactly how we felt when we went there. Located at the crossroads of US 136 and Highway 341 is Hillsboro, Indiana. Some people may know this town as the home of 600 happy people and a few old soreheads. Well, you're about to meet not the old soreheads, but two of those very happy people, Richard and Donna Myers. Now, when most people near their retirement years, they think about slowing down, but not the Myers. Instead, they decided to get into the theater business. 
After running two other performance theaters, they moved their operation to Richard's hometown of Hillsboro. We've never been sorry that we landed here. The people in the community are wonderful. And it was like so many rural towns, there was lots of empty buildings. Now there isn't any empty buildings. That's because Richard and Donna purchased and refurbished eight of them, including two bed and breakfasts. In 2002, they had just three months to transform a block of century-old buildings into a full-service dinner theater. Together, the Myers run the business, doing everything from costumes, food preparation, and set design. Of course, then they come out with a prop list, and then we run around trying to find props and stuff. If we don't have it, we have to make it or something anyway. And then, of course, then we do the food, which, you know, we, you know, uh, do all the cooking. And so it's, you know, that's mainly my job right now is like working on the set and, and helping in the kitchen. He's the glue that keeps Meyer's <laughs> Dinner Theater together because uh, if it wasn't for what he does here and his talent, it just wouldn't take place. Donna's past experience as a hairdresser decorator and bridal shop owner have come in quite handy in the theater business. And I do all the costumes um, and I love that. See that's where having the bridal store and knowing fabrics and things that I love that design and it's a part of the that decorating design comes in and then doing the hairstyles on uh, doing those wigs being a hairdresser, it's been very vital for this business too. The theater's central location has made it a popular stop for bus tours. Guests from all over the world have made their way to Myers. Throughout the year, the stage features well-known Broadway hits, musical reviews, and gospel music. On this November afternoon, we were invited to the opening of A Dickens of a Christmas. Based on A Christmas Carol, this production is an original work written just for Meyer's Dinner Theater. As guests enter the theater, each one is greeted by a hug from Donna. And when they're waiting to be seated, they can shop in the store, and they like the old piano being played out in the lobby. And some days they'll sing and they get to dancing, and it's, it's just... Uh, hooch, you know, they have so much fun. Prior to the show, dinner is served, just one of the many things that Myers has become famous for. Uh, some of the younger people think what we are fixing is gourmet cooking. <laughs> well, to us, it's just what we were raised on, you know, it's, it's not that at all. It's just <laughs> down home. Some things we cannot change, like the broccoli salad or the salad dressing that I've created, and Richard's rolls, Richard's buns, um, and the Swiss steak. Those things, um, pretty much, they have to stay on. But we will change the menu a little bit to go for either the holiday season or for the show. We like that part of it because it makes it very relaxed and people just sort of settle in and we prepare our food like we're preparing for a family to come over. Now food isn't the only Myers claim to fame. Interestingly enough, their bathrooms are quite the hit. He likes to decorate, so when the architect was, of course, by being state inspected, he had to draw up all the old buildings too. And, Randy had a men and women's bathroom. I told Randy, I said, this is not going to work. And he said, why? And I said, well, there's all these women getting off the bus anyway. But anyway, and I said, my wife likes to decorate bathrooms. And so that's how it is. So it, it's fun. It, but it was, again, for our own enjoyment. Who would have ever guessed it would have been such a hit? After a delicious home cooked meal, it's showtime. Actors are both local and regional players who try out at the beginning of the season. And our stage is not very large, 
but we make it work and really people have really enjoyed that not such large casts that they don't you know connect. As you notice you think we work too the cast members work too because sometimes they say well who's the dresser who's the prop and we say you are <laughs> <laughs> In addition to being stagehands, the actors oftentimes will play multiple roles, sometimes as many as five or six. What totally amazes me, though, is Michael and Linnea. Have, this is their fifth Christmas show. They have performed in every show for the last five years, and they change their accents or their whole personality for that role. And I, I just think they're wonderful. They do such a marvelous job. But we, we do find wonderful talent like that. Shows are chosen about two years in advance with an emphasis on family-friendly themes. Throughout the year, there's very little time to rest because as one show is ending, preparations are underway for the next. When asked about their favorite part, Richard and Donna both agree it's the people and their desire to make them feel right at home. I spent a lot of time talking with this, um, uh, the two couples that were at table five and he said, now I hope I say this right to you, but he said, the minute I opened that front door, I knew I was gonna be in love with this place. And I said, really? now." Why is that? Because we hear that so many times. And he said, it just feels different in here. It's very comfortable and laid back. And that always makes me want to cry because, you know, we're busy running around and we miss that. But I am so glad that our guests feel that. Now you can watch Heartland Highways online anytime. Check us out at youtube.com slash WEIUTV. Once you're there, just look for the Heartland Highways playlist, which will take you to a list of full episodes from season 7 through 11. And if you subscribe to our channel, you'll automatically be notified of when new programs are available to view. So sign up today. They say that everyone has at least some of the same memories of a place, and putting those memories together creates a collective picture of what that place means to our particular region or in its culture. That's essentially what the Building Memories exhibit at Eastern Illinois University does each year. This year we talked to some of the people involved in the project, and I think you'll find our discoveries very interesting. You know how sometimes people pass through places over time and seem to have similar memories of it? Well, what I didn't know is there's actually a term for this called public memory. And public memory is certainly something the generations of people and students who have come to Eastern Illinois University seem to share. This phenomena is something EIU Historical Administration students in conjunction with EIU faculty set out to capture in a recent research project. We did an exhibit at the Tarbell for the 100th anniversary of the university. Um, that was back in, well, not of the university, but of Old Main. Uh, and the exhibit opened in 2000 at Tarbell Arts Center. Um, so we did a lot of history about the university back then. And um, uh, we started discussions with the staff at Booth Library about possibly having the historical administration uh, produce an exhibit for them. and. I'm not sure how the idea of uh, one about the history of Eastern came about, but eventually that it did, and uh, everybody thought that would be a great idea. Not particularly focused just on the history, but how we think of public memory, a collective memory, um, and what that means and um, what it means to a campus community, how you create memories uh, or end a campus community. We really wanted to think about their own experience at Eastern and then kind of connect to how, or connect to other students of the past that, hey, these students were here 50 years ago, but look, they still participate in athletics, they still live in the dorms, they went to class. It was all 
here to get an education, to head out into the real world, but also to have a good time on campus through their extracurricular activities, if they were in Greek or if they were just um, in athletics or in their various student organizations, and just kind of connect all of these students ever since Eastern opened that kind of a, there's a whole public memory of how people experience Eastern. What they discovered is that the memories came in collective waves. Students of the Vietnam War era remembered campus protests, and those around the late 40s and early 50s probably remember campus golden retriever Napoleon, and so on. Artifacts representing many of these memories were on display for a short time in EIU's Booth Library, and now they're housed in the university archives. They used, you know, for instance, in that case right there, they used a, a guitar that once belonged to Burl Ives. Uh, there's a zither on display in that case that uh, belonged to the first uh, music professor, and uh, Fre Frederick Koch. And uh, they uh, utilize things uh, from dealing with athletics that we have in the archives. And they also borrowed some objects from other people to include in the exhibit. Uh, there's a case dealing with Pemberton Hall over here. And so we have some artifacts from Pemberton Hall. Some of the first dishes that they used and photographs. One of the main things that they used from the archives were photographs. We used in the exhibit a lot of, of uh, things that are in the archives collection. They also, I think, found some photographs from other people that they, that they scanned and, and made uh, use of in the exhibit. There is an uh, inventory of the archives and uh, we're continually trying to improve it and add things to it that aren't in the inventory. Um, and so it's, it's an ongoing process, but you know, little by little, we're attempting to make the archives more visible. The most recent thing we've done is establish an institutional repository online. It's called The Keep, and you can get to that from the library homepage and search for whatever you want to search for, and maybe you'll find something. The undertaking of the Collective Memory Project also brought about some interesting historical discoveries that might have remained a mystery otherwise. Well, one of the great things that we found out is that there was a lake on campus about right behind where we're standing that they used to ice skate on and they probably fished and that students would sit around but as you can see that's gone and no one remembers that there was a lake here and then we found all these stories just kind of digging through archives that there used to be on campus um, in the home ec department they would raise children every year is kind of practice mothering and practice like home care. So a child, they would send a baby to Eastern every year and the um, girls would raise it. But then they decided that that wasn't a great idea. It was kind of a big controversy and they shut that program down. And again, a lot, a lot of people knew that happened. And then we also discovered that um, behind us there's this rock that commemorates a student who was killed in action in World War I and there actually used to be a field kind of where Booth Library is that commemorated his experience on campus and then the fact that he had died and that they wanted to remember him permanently but then as time passed the building has replaced the field there's now just a rock kind of off to the side that's taken his place and then not a lot of people remember him anymore. We found pictures and there was a water fountain that's supposed to be by the tennis courts so we went out to the tennis courts, didn't see this water fountain, and we found in the article it said it was lost. So we were like, all right, well, let's keep hunting. So we were wandering around campus looking for anything that had dates on it, and we found that there was a water fountain outside of Old Main, kind of behind in the back. And we're like, well, hey, this looks like this water fountain. It had the date on it, so like, well, it didn't really disappear. It's still here, but probably no one really realizes that this is a significant water fountain that was donated and it used to be out in a different place. The research process also found the students conducting interviews with alumni and working through old documents, articles, and publications, all to determine and categorize these collective memories. One thing that stood out to those involved in the project too was how memories connected generations past and hopefully those yet to come too. 
Growing up in Charleston, people kind of think Eastern is its own little community and there's the rest of Charleston or the rest of Illinois. Bay. But Eastern is definitely a place for people to come. I mean, the library's open. You can come speak to the, I mean, if you want to look at history of Eastern or Charleston's, come to the archives. It's available to come walk around, to look at. It's a very nice campus. You can go look in the buildings. It's not just for the students here. It's kind of for everybody to experience. I learned quite a bit from doing this story and there's a lot of history and other information out there about Eastern, which is where we work every day that I didn't even know. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Now for more information about the people or places we feature in our show, please visit our website at weiu.net. We'll see you next time. If you'd like to purchase a copy of a Heartland Highways program, contact us at 1-877-727-9348. You can also visit our online store at weiu.net or mail in your order with payment to the address on the screen. DVDs are $25 each. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or American Express are accepted. Just let us know what show you're interested in by mentioning the story name or the person featured in the show. A group of theater-loving individuals. Oh, I don't know what I was looking at. <laughs> <laughs> Hello! <laughs> How many shrubs are they removing? Do they out really there? need to do it like right here, right now? Do they not know we're doing TV in here? <laughs> Apparently not. Hurry, let's go before he comes okay. back. Three, two. Three, two, one.